The Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show. It's brought to you along with Levi Solicitors. 10% discount on your legal fees. LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. Dan here, along with Michael and Moscow, who is wearing a beautiful blue Puma Packard Bell sponsored shirt, which you can see on the video version. If you are listening, have a look on YouTube. You will find it on there and reminisce about a better time um, at Ellen Road on a real upswing as we do the TSB guide to Michael Bridges' hat trick versus Southampton. He was wearing that blue shirt on the day. Not one like it. Not that actual. Not this actual one. Although this is from 1999. Right. It's my original one that Michael Bridges is constantly pestering me to try and get off me. I still have fancy. I still have mine as well. The Packard Bell's peeling off just a tiny, tiny bit, but it's held up quite well. It's got it's got little holes in the letters, hasn't it? That it shirt. does. It's nice, yeah, though. it's a real nice detail. So you don't get a sweaty mid-belly. What's on the back of yours, though, that you don't like? Q19. Yes, good. It was At the time it was wrong, because I think it, this was... Is this the year he switched to number 10 as yeah, well? Yeah. So I think he got, got it with the wrong fucking number on, then it turned out it was a prick as I'm well. The just, wrong to, fucking player. <laughs> no, just to add to it. No refunds. <laughs> Absolutely least, awful. You didn't get... Hasselbank 9. I don't know, I'm sure. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the summer of the departure of Jimmy Hasselbank, who went off piggy bank, they were calling him at the time, because he wanted a big pay increase. We weren't going to pay it because Peter Ridsdale, we all know. He said, no, thank you. Yes. We, don't, we don't give out daft contracts at this place. No. <laughs> you go, you go off to elsewhere if you want to do that. People think that's a joke, but that was actually his justification. And I will say this, mm. Moscow, my dad bumped into Peter Ridsdale coming out of the store in the White Rose Centre, the shopping centre, mm. Um, just down the road from here. Been in the till, Addy. I mean, no, for legal reasons. That's, he <laughs> you know, absolutely it, had not. If, if he was doing a cash drop at the bank, yeah, he would maybe, have been, maybe. Yeah. Um, but what he did say is that Hasselbank was asking for something outrageous, like eighty grand a week, and they were mm. prepared to go up to forty. Being sensible, looking after the pennies, you know. Yeah. Pounds take I don't, care. I don't think it was as much as eighty grand back then. You know, was it not? I think I think footballers weren't paid as much in those days. Either but way. No. Anyway, it was. It would. It within, was now, It would within a few years be not a ridiculous salary. According to Ridsdale, it was an outrageous amount of money. Um, and they weren't prepared to pay it, so they let him go off to uh, Atletico Madrid. Didn't um, matter. Well, this is it. Bridgie had been signed prior to that, and there was a little bit of talk about maybe playing up front together, which would have been good fun. Yeah, it's, the, it's almost the unknown from this season, isn't it? Because uh, it turned out to be a good season anyway, but had we had the two of them, could yeah. there have been a title challenge? And mm. we, were, we were bolstering things at the back as well, a couple of young punks in Danny Mills and Michael Dubery. England's the fu- future. The future mm-hmm. of England's defence. Uh, have been recruited as as well. Um, we brought Batty back not long before this, so it was all heading in the right direction. Yeah, Danny Granville, <laughs> him too. It was just overloaded with good young players. Eric yeah. Backer, yeah. And obviously the previous year we'd seen Smith and Woodgate and all that that crop breakthrough as well. Had Backer turned up yet? I think he this, t- did. We get back of the season. Didn't yes, he turn up? I he turned. I think he turned up in from ahead of the season, like either at the end of the previous season or at the start of this. It was a weird time yeah. before transfer windows were quite so rigid. Yeah, well, we got him at, during this sort of time anyway. Yes. Um, and to Bridgie himself, anyway, he played in the Premier League some years prior, um, 96, 97, when some of them were up, but then they'd got relegated, so uh, had a couple of years in the Championship. I'd kind of not really heard of him when we signed him. No, so even, even though I was aware that he was quite highly rated because that's what the press said. Yeah, I mean, you didn't watch... The championship, did you? Either? No, I still, so, still don't. So there might be in vague memories of him from playing for Sunderland before, but we were, I mean, particularly then, Leeds were in the Premier League. I'm not watching that. <laughs> I'm not going to go out of my way to find championship football. An attitude there, that echoes down the ages. There was a bit more about that level in um, magazines and stuff. Like, I'm sure I'd read about Michael Bridges mm. in 90 Minutes or something like that that did feature what was going on in the, the lesser leagues. And Sunderland had the attention because they were coming up with Peter Reid, who was quite a big... Uh, name still and um, they had Niall Quinn with disco pants up front with Kevin Phillips and the number of goals that they were scoring was always a story but yeah then Bridges was kind of the third wheel in that strike partnership which is how we got him yeah Mm. so he was even though he was in some ways the most valuable of the three also didn't really play because, yeah, because he just didn't didn't fit the system and there was a little there was a little bit of um, upset on Weir's side that he'd done that because uh you know that he was turning his back on Sunderland when he was such a, a good young player. But his point was just like, well, if you if you think I'm such a good young player, drop Nile Quinn and play me. Yeah, mm. I never knew this as well. Some interesting detail here that he'd gone down to sign for George Graham at Spurs, but that's because he was a Spurs fan because of Chris Waddle. Mm. Yeah, he was talking about this on the official Leeds United podcast not long ago. But yeah, he got as far as 
um, as Spurs, and then Alan Sugar came in and was a cock, basically. And so he, did, so he didn't bother signing Alan. That's, Sh- that seems very out of character. It, it does, doesn't it? But Alan Sugar came in. Well, I don't know who you are, but they were, we're spending five million pounds on you, so you, you better be good, and we're not going to pay you what your agent wants. And he was just basically a twat. It's up there with Brian Clough slagging off Gary McAllister's cowboy boots. <laughs> so he decided to come to Leeds instead. Do you know what? I always loved Bridgie, particularly because I'm exactly the same age as him. I'm about a couple of months older than him. So I always felt that, that kinship mm. that you do, when you, you know, when you get a footballer that's like born in the same year as you, you feel like they're kind of you out there on the pitch. Yeah. But it was a nice, him coming to us instead of Spurs as well. Obviously, it was entirely down to Alan Sugar, as it turns out. But it, it felt like getting one over on George Graham as well, because he obviously done the dirty on us the year before. And it was... In some ways, Michael Bridges was was do, dealing with a couple of Judas bastards at once mm. in, in Hasselbank and Graham. So that was nice. <laughs> uh, so the lineup then for this day down at the Dell: uh, Nigel Martin in goal, defenders Mills, Woodgate, Radabay, and Hart. Dubry in there as well. So is that a back five that we're we're looking at? Or a back three? Oh, interesting. You've got Mill, as we'll see later on, Mills bombing on in midfield: Bowyer, Batty, Hopkin, with Kuehl and Bridges um, up front. So it looks relatively inexperienced. Mind you, we'd lost their season before, aren't we, quite badly, 3-0. Mm, yeah, um, O'Leary had said it was a, the worst performance of, of his time, to that point, anyway. Um, looking at the opposition lineup in the former Southampton, uh, some names you might recognise in there. Um, Jones, Dodd, Richards, Lundekram, Francis Benali, Letitia, or is it? Um, Mark Hughes, Marsden, Boo. Cash Lul, Marion Pahars, and uh, Egil Ostenstadt. It's a vintage. This is basically the team I still think Southampton should have. Mm. <laughs> well, there's a real explanation there as to why there was so much positivity around Leeds at this point. Because if you compare Mark Hughes, who at this point is like, what is he, 50? And he's still got his like horrible grey bubble perm um, combination mullet. Marsden's just like a weird old guy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Letitia obviously Finale was, had a moustache at the time good, but moustaches no one had moustaches as well yeah Egil Ostenstad was from they bought him from Wimbledon did he go to Liverpool at one point or was that somebody else but anyway Austin, they all just like looked old and boring <laughs> and like the Dell was just like I mean it had charm and you'd miss it now but it was like a horrible little place and then it was us and we're dressed as Lazio and we've got our new badge and we've got Kuehl and he's going out with a, a soap star and Michael Bridges is five million pounds and Dubry and Mills are England under 21 internationals and Woodgate is the, the uh, pathway is the best ever and we've got Smith on the bench and we've got um just loads of we just were cool at that point and you know David Hopkin was also there but um, I will just correct you that Egil Ostenstadt didn't play for Wimbledon. I think, uh, you're, I think you're confusing Egil Olsen, the elderly manager of Wimbledon. <laughs> no, I'm trying, who was the, the midfielder that played for Wimbledon and who went to Liverpool? Uh, Leonardson. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, close, close enough, close enough. Leslie Mark Hughes was nearly 36 years old when this game took place. So he this, looked so much older. Yeah, and you can see it when you look at the, the footage of the game. You can see we look like a really cool team and Southampton just look like a bunch of old losers. Sexy David Hopkin. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Hey, you don't need teeth to be sexy. Bringing in the ladies. Um, we were one 0 up inside eleven minutes. Talk me through it. This is, in some ways, this is the goal. It's his first goal for Leeds, and it's the goal for Michael Bridges. Never got better than this. <laughs> <today. laughs> it's such a lovely goal, though. I mean, Kewell's come in from the uh, from the right hand side. He's been fouled by an old man, Chris Marsden. <laughs> So from the free kick, he's about 35 yards out and it's chipped in towards the box, towards Dubry. Lundek Varm just gets ahead of him, gets ahead of kind of half clear, but it comes to Bridges who's on the edge of the box. And his first touch, because it's kind of going a bit high and a bit behind him, but first touch just brings it back in front of him, then on the volley. It's weird because he, he's not hit hard and it's the keeper's too close to his line for it to really be a lob. But yet it is a lob. It's just so nicely placed. There's something, there's something delightful about lobs when the keepers... It looks like the keeper's going to get to it until he can't. And there's one or two doubts about the signing as well, particularly because we played Derby in that opening game of the season at Ellen Road and drawn nil-nil. You're like, well, where's this £5 million pounds gone on this young punk? Why is he not scoring yet? But he soon put those doubts to bed, didn't he? It's interesting reading the BBC report of that Derby game as well. The opening um, paragraph, the opening sentence, Leeds title-tipped side drew a frustrating blank against the spirited Rams... England manager Kevin Keegan's watching as well at this point. Were we tight? I don't, I don't remember us being title Title, tipped. title tips. I remember thinking we might be in sort of top three or four, but I, I don't remember ever thinking we were in a title. We'd challenge. ended the season before on a high and spent all this money on players and we looked cool. 
<laughs> but I mean, looking at the players we signed, though, I suppose it's a di- it's a different league context, isn't it, than it is now when you have to spend hundreds of millions of pounds. But we signed a Charlton fullback, a player who couldn't get in Chelsea's team, and Michael Bridges, who was coming from the Championship. That wouldn't be enough these days, would it, for, for anyone to consider that to be suitable strengthening for a, chi- a title challenge? Just to, to timestamp this as well, you know the Derby game that preceded this one? That was the day that the Billy Bremner statue was officially unveiled at Ellen Road, which has become obviously a, very much a, a landmark and a gathering point now in uh, in 2023. Um, Mark Hughes, talk to me about the old man. Ah. <laughs> Good, this. Yes, yeah, this is great. It's almost, <laughs> I mean, you're right that Michael Bridges' goal is kind of the thing that this is... It's the real highlight, but every time this comes up, it's like, oh, yeah, that happened as well. And it happened to Mark Hughes. Yes, yeah, so mm. th- this is, uh, at, we're 1-0 up at this point. They take a corner, it goes to the far post. Mark Hughes um, hits a volley. As he always did. As he did. The bastard. Was it spiteful? It I it. imagine it was spitefully hit. It was, really. We, it's a shame we didn't have um, Chris Fairclough around at this point to come and sort out his, his temples with his knees. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the Dell, for anyone who doesn't remember it, was Southampton's old ground and it was very, very compact and the net was incredibly shallow and actually rested up against the advertising boards. So when he hits this shot, it goes in. I think David Hopkin is near to it on the line. Some of the reports describe it as striking David Hopkin on the line. It doesn't. No, it, it, it strikes the advertising it, board. It strikes the advertising board, bounces out. And there's very little fuss about it, actually. To, to be, just to make it absolutely clear, it goes over the line into the goal, oh, yeah. the back of the net hits the advertising holding behind the goal and bounces out again. And then uh, some very, I'm not sure which Leeds players it is, but very quick thinking to dive on that and start trying to clear it as if it hasn't gone in. I don't know if that contributed to the referee's confusion, but the referee, the linesman and several journalists, um, nobody thought it had gone in. Mark Hughes seemed to think it had, which just made it all, all the sweeter. Quiz question for you then. Do you know who scored the last ever goal at the Dell? Somebody with a Leeds United connection? Oh, I thought it was Matt Letizia. I mean, he scored a lot against us. Um, well, did he? I'm thinking of Alan Shearer. I thought I thought it was um, I thought it was Matt Letizia because I thought that was part of the part of the that, story. That was the last competitive goal last at the Dell. But they had a friendly against Brighton at seven days after the season had finished. Um, and on Wikipedia it says on the 26th of May the club's fans said goodbye to the Dell by stripping it of all of its seats the pitch and even the advertising boards after their last game at the stadium a 1-0 victory in a friendly against Brighton uh, the first and last opponents at the stadium which is why they um, had the friendly because was... the goal and the last ever goal I at the Dell was scored by Gordon Strachan nope Dan Harding yeah. no <laughs> by um, Brighton I thought Strachan because he managed them didn't he shall I tell you go on it's Juve Rosler Oh, there you go. They, I mean, on, on the referee for this game, this was um, Alan Wiley, who was a Premier League referee for, for quite some time after this, but it, this was it was his first ever game, and reports say he basically made a bit of a twat of it. So, I mean, we, there were nine nine bookings. <laughs> he made a bit of it. Is that what the official I mean, match was? That's what it said, yes. If the ball is uh, going bouncing out the back of the net and he's not giving a goal, but yeah, nine, it's a bit of an error. Nine bookings overall. Can you guess any of the Leeds players that were booked? It's, it's a real tough one. Batty. Correct. Hopkin. <laughs> um, Hopkin wasn't, actually. Mills. Mills, correct. Uh, Radaby? Mm, no, uh, no. Dubes? Dubes. <laughs> Mills, surely. Lee, Bo- Lee Bowyer, yeah, Bowyer. Uh, Backer, Batty, Bowyer, Mills, Dubes, all booked. Excellent form, excellent form. Um, so we get to half time at, at 1-0, even though it should have been 1-1. <laughs> uh, and then we scored early in the second half, and it was young Bridgie again. And it was young Danny Mills, showing us a... He's giving us a first taste of what he can Effing do. Effing brilliant, that lad. You know that. It was a very Danny Mills run. Head down. Mills. Belt it down the line. Run after it. Cross it in. But it's another... It's a good finish, is this. It's a beautiful finish. Because it's... It looks kind of simple, but actually, he's still got a goalkeeper to beat, and he could easily have tried to take a touch or complicated it. But instead, when the ball's crossed in... Just sweeps it in with his with the side foot. He sort of complicates it, but in a good way because he slows down mm. as the ball is coming to him, as the keeper is coming to him. He kind of, instead of rushing to meet it and hitting it under the keeper, he kind of he slows down and sees what the keeper is doing and then plays it into the corner where the keeper can't get to it. There's just this very subtle little moment when Bridges really. It's a little bit like the first goal where. He, he takes his time over putting that ball in the air and 
picking the spot, putting in the corner. There's the same thing where it's just gone like it's a real high pressure moment, but he just goes, ah, I'll just see what happens and then I'll decide what I'm going to do. Beautiful, composed, and he's composed God, enough to uh, to yeah. have tripped up Dean Richards as well on the way. Mm. Yeah, he was appealing <laughs> appealing for a foul. That I mean, he's he's yeah. just on the floor by the penalty spot as Bridges strokes this one in, so it does make the finish a bit a bit easier for him not having to play there. But then, I think it's I think if if he goes down, it's an innocent tangle of legs. <laughs> and then twenty minutes later, game over, three nil, another one for Bridgie. hat trick, boom. And, and is this allowed? A corner that you scored from? Mm-hmm, apparently so. Ian Hart on the uh, on the corner duty. He's out swinging it then, yeah? Straight forward, yep. Yeah. Just to the near post. Bridges in there to... Uh, it's nice to see him scoring a different type of goal, though. Well, they're all, all three of these are very different goals, which was... It's a shame he didn't get the perfect hat-trick. With, with two on his right foot and one on yeah. his head, yeah. He, he should have he really put the close range on with his left. Just to make a point. No, knowing, knowing, knowing that he was going to get... Knowing he was going to get the header yeah, yeah, almost yeah, afterwards, of, but... Of course. But there was one disallowed for offside as well. He nearly had four in this, didn't he? No, it wasn't offside. It was a handball. Nah. When there was unjustly uh, as well by that fool Alan Wiley. Yeah, he popped it in as uh, the ball had been handled on its way to him. But um, four would have been maybe too much. There was something beautiful about three, three nil hat trick. Just great. I know we we joke now, but I actually did listen to this one on the radio. I rem- I remember it quite well. For some reason, the memory of it and just thinking. God, he's, he's, we've got we've somehow managed to sign the best player in the world here. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I did want him reading about actually. It was the first hat trick a Leeds player had scored since Gary McAllister quite a few years mm. earlier. So Leeds hat tricks at this point, I'm only I've seen Tony Yeboa score some, seen Gary McAllister get one, but like it wasn't a it wasn't something I was used to seeing as a as a fairly young man still. So this game, I've spoken about it on the podcast before when people have said, "What's your happiest moment as a Leeds fan?" And it was this game, and it was I didn't listen to it and I didn't pay anything attention. Well, I paid attention to it. I want to know what's going on. But it was the same day. It was played the same day as the solar eclipse that uh, captivated the country. So I was in Cornwall for that, which was the main, going to be the epicenter of uh, the sun, um, where you could see it best. So we were camping. And so all that happened on the day, and it was very exciting. And The day of this game? Yeah, yeah. August the 11th was the yeah, yeah. eclipse. And um, so we're down there for that. And then, yeah, on the piss in the evening, um, and I remember waking up at the campsite the next day and there was a newspaper. And so let's well, let's see, I was 19, I think, sitting in the deck chair with a paper sit, reading about Michael Bridges scoring this hat-trick in a 3-0 win and looking at the photos. It was the first time in a Premier League match that we'd worn this kit. We'd worn it in friendlies before and just looking at how good the kit looked and um, reading about how good the goals were. And it came with the news that after Hasselbank had gone, we'd bought uh, Darren Huckabee, mm-hmm. who was another, like, Mills, Dubry, Bridges, highly rated, England under-21, international, scored a, he scored a hat-trick against us, he did, didn't yeah. he, for Coventry. Um, so we'd replaced Hasselbank with this really cool, new, young, exciting player. I remember just sitting there um, in the sunshine in of August, having seen... Uh, this like remarkable solar event the day before, and um, who's the what's the name of the BBC presenter? Hugh Jenkins. So we'd seen him. I'm sure he was presenting it. So we'd like we'd seen the BBC studio um, and been so like a solar eclipse and uh, Hugh Jenkins and the BBC was very exciting and just um, feeling like everything was just really right in the world. Yeah. It's, uh, Apart from the sun being blocked out, which could be alarming under other circumstances. Oh, it was quite exciting at the time. The birds didn't seem to like it. That's the main thing I remember for the eclipses. What was wrong with them? Hey? Well, the they birds? all uh, flew off. Oh, those birds. Um, because, I mean, in the event, it was actually quite cloudy. So it was quite, <laughs> quite difficult to work out exactly what was going on. But when, so you're all looking around going, is it happening? Is it happening? And then it suddenly got really, just before it got really dark, every bird on the bay, on the beach flew away and then it got really dark you're like oh it's happening and then the clouds uh parted and we all had the special um everyone i think they'd been given away with the newspapers weren't they yeah Yeah, yeah, like special glasses to make sure that people didn't uh burn their eyes off looking at the sun (laughs) directly i believe that's what medically happens as well yeah Yeah, so do all of that retinas just melt 
and it was uh, yeah, good times, good times. I was still know. fretting about the uh, Millennium Bug. Still worried about that. That's <laughs> <point. laughs> sure. going around the. Co- this eclipse can't be good news now. There's a Mill- <laughs> Millennium Bugs coming. Too much going on at once, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah, this was absolutely my pomp. This was. I'd just uh, just finished university, 21 years old, having a right old time, and I remember standing outside in the uh, in the sort of the quad, the quadrangle. At university, like going, oh wow, this is exciting. Um, the good David, news was David O'Leary wasn't getting carried away in, with the Millennium Fever, was he? Indeed, no. Um, we had good sense from O'Leary. He said, uh, you "Well, you're going to do it in his bit, voice." Oh god, it's, don't don't commit a race hate it, crime. It's, it's gonna, yeah, it's, it's dangerous, isn't it? So he, he says. It's quality finish. Is the just, potential just, just to, just be, to be sure, someone. is it just because we've got a lot of Irish listeners that you're not prepared to do it? But if it was someone a bit more obscure, you're prepared to do that. If you're upset, Australian yeah. David O'Leary. <laughs> we've already upset Americans. I'd be willing to do that. Yeah. The, the, well, the, and the, what would an American David O'Leary sound like? <laughs> well, don't do it. Probably not... Irish still, wouldn't he? Yeah, probably. Yeah. He'd live in Boston. Go on. But um, So that was fine, saying he's got real good potential. He expects him to make Sorry, goals I'm and score them. <laughs> David O'Leary being from Boston and going, we've got babies looking after babies. That's a really terrible Boston accent. <laughs> I've, been, I don't even... I've been to Boston. It didn't sound like that. Moscow. No. How, how would it sound if David O'Leary was from Boston? He was talking about babies looking after Are you babies. Boston in Lincolnshire? Or? Boston. Boston. <laughs> Massachusetts. You mean? Massachusetts. Yeah. But he says, I, I, I brought Michael Bridges in with the intention that he would develop over the years, he has the potential to develop into a sleeky Dennis Burkamp in a squad which could eventually be on a par <laughs> with the great Don Revie teams. <laughs> All right. You've so you're saying he's not Premier League ready? 1-1, one, 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 one drawn one <laughs> against Derby and Southampton this season. Just, I mean, the other implication of that is if the team is on a par with the great Don Revie teams, then the manager... What does Obviously. it say about the manager? And then um, Phil at the YEP, different one. Phil Rostron. So yeah, the OG if, Phil, yeah, version so if, one. If uh, if sheer undiluted class is what you admire in a striker, then here it was in a league of its own. And it was so good. And it was the feeling of a new player arriving as well. I think that you you get those. We've had that moment with Nonto, haven't we, recently, where you've, he's, he's done stuff and you've gone, fucking hell, we're, we've got something here. Yeah, there's that thing. I mean, everybody, there's, I mean, in this team we had... Alan Smith, obviously, and we brought back you back, and Woodgate was coming through. So there's always that feeling of closeness to homegrown players, but sometimes when you just spend £5 million on a player or whatever it is now, um, and they just turn out to be really good. Like Yeboah as well. Yeboah was a big... Was he our... He wouldn't have been our record at the time, maybe. But three and a half million on Yeboah, mm-hmm. and he was just a goal machine. He's got like, that's great. And it didn't matter that whether he was from, you know, Beeston or from Ghana. It was just, there's a really good player. And same with um, Michael Bridges. It's like, wow, he's good and he's playing for us now. And don't even the shorts look good on that kit. And um, in the run-up to Christmas, we played 17 games after this. First one after this was Man United away, which we lost 2-0. Bit disappointing. But of the 17 games that followed it, up to and including Boxing Day, we won 13 of them, lost three and drew only one. Imagine that. Imagine winning 13 games in the Premier League. Mm, And then imagine... uh... Going for a night out and messing it all up, but that's a different story. Isn't that was, it? At this point, was, I don't think we could do that in a guide to. For no, goodness sake. Michael Bridges was, very was not on that night out. I don't no, think. he was uh, innocent entirely of, of everything. The only problem was that uh, eventually um, his ankles proved to be a longer term problem. When it's an absolute tragedy, because you can see just in this game, just the, the finishes, the composure. Um, I don't know what to make of like a sleeky. Dennis Burkamp as Dennis, o, uh, Dennis O'Leary was calling him, um, but he had that quality. You, you know, you talk. We talk about tens more often. Back then, we used to just talk about Dennis Burkamp because I think he was the only player in the league. Maybe after Cantona, he would dropped off a striker. It's like, wow, what is he doing? Um, but he had that, and yeah, he, he would be the the ten, but also a good goal scorer as well. Oh, I, I, I think it's a shame how Michael Bridges turned out. But let's. This was good. This was happiness. And do you want to know the exciting postscript to this? Is it Matt Letitia? It's not Matt Letitia. Wild opinion. It's not. I've never heard him talk about that um, Mark Hughes goal. I'm surprised he's not tried to wrap that up. With him and Wright said Fred haven't done an hour long podcast about it. I saw Michael Bridges in IKEA in Leeds not long after this. Wow. What was he getting? Hot dog. He deserved it. Is that where his uh, later goal celebration came from? Was he eating it sideways? Because he used to do a sandwich thing, didn't he? As if he was eating a a baguette. Maybe maybe, maybe it was a meatball sandwich. Did you? Well, maybe he eats a, a hot dog sideways, Michael. <laughs> Who doesn't? Michael, if you're out there and you can confirm which direction you eat a hot dog, north to south or east to west. And on that bombshell, 
That is the TSB guide to Michael Bridges' hat trick at Southampton. We'll see you soon. The Square Ball Podcast. 